uh, on the Wednesday when we get back from break, and exam number two the following Monday. All right, today we're going to dive into a new topic. We're going to cover, in the next couple of days, we're going to cover number theory and integers, integer representation. Some of this will be reviewed, some of it will not. Uh, these are going to be the last concepts we cover until that next exam, so we're sort of wrapping up the second third of the class right now. Um, today we're going to introduce the concepts uh, underlying number theory, and so there's going to be a, a lot of definitions, few examples, a lot of theorems, things of that sort. But I'll try to mix in, uh, we'll try to throw in, if we have time, applications. We'll talk about hash functions, which are uh, a common application of, of some of these uh, number theory concepts and constructs that we're going to learn about. All right, um, and then we'll do some more theory, and, and then when we get back from break, we'll do some more applications. And number theory is used a lot in computer science uh, for hash functions. Uh, used a lot for ciphers, encryption, security, right, random number generators, right, these... Right, these concepts are used quite a bit in computer science, so it's it's not hard to find applications. Right, we'll try to cram in some good ones here before we wrap up uh, the second third of our class. All right, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead and start with number theory. Let's see. Right, the first concept we're going to discuss is one that we've encountered before, especially during uh, the logic portion of, uh, of our class, right, the concept of division. Many of you have learned about division before. Right. Right. And we even learned about the divides operator. Right? If we have A divides B, right, we read this as A divides B. Right? This is true if right, there exists some C right, such that B equals A times C. Right, this is if A, B, and C are integers. Right, if this is true, if A divides B, then we say that A and C are factors of B. Right. This is all, all good and well. I think everyone knows this. It's important, though, to rely upon these definitions if we need to prove anything or if we need to maybe inspect some of these concepts and applications in more detail. We'll very likely rely on some of these definitions, so it's good to just sort of keep them in the back of our minds. And now we will go ahead and introduce some theorems related to the divides operator. Some of these properties of the divides operator we already encountered when we discussed relations, right? This divides operation is a relation. You can define the relation based on the divides operator, right? So one of the, I think it was an example in class, or was it a homework example where we uh, discussed the, transit, the transitivity of the divides operator, and that is one of the parts of our theorem here. So we can go ahead and introduce. We'll enumerate the theorems in case we need to refer to them later. We'll call this theorem, we'll call this theorems one. And there's many parts to it. Theorems one. Right. For this, we'll let A, B, and C be integers again. All right, if this is true, then we have if A divides B and A divides C, then a divides B plus C. And again, this should be fairly intuitive. If A divides B, right, and A divides C, then that common, that factor can be pulled out of the sum, right, A plus C. And so A should divide B plus C as well. Right, similarly, also fairly intuitive, if A divides B, All right, then A divides B, C, right, for all C. And again, pretty, pretty clear, if B has uh, A as in a factor, then B times C will also have A as a factor. And 
and also we have if a divides b and b divides c, then a divides c, and this is our, our transitivity of this relationship, right? Again, we convinced ourselves of this when we, when we were discussing relations, right? If uh, b has a as n factor, right, and b divides c, right, then, then c will also have this factor. And A as a factor. Right. And then lastly, right, if A divides B right, and A divides C, right, then A divides M B plus N C. Right, and this is for all and then And Z. All right, again, the beginning of our lecture today, we're going to go over a number of theorems, some properties, a lot of definitions. We'll do a few examples as we go, right? and then we'll take a break and go over some applications, see why we're learning about all this stuff. All right. All right let's take a look at a new, uh, another theorem here. And, a definition also of the modulus function. Again, we've learned about the divides function or the, the divides operator. Right? Now we'll learn about the modulus operator and uh, formally define it. And we'll call this theorem slash definition two. And for here, we'll have A be an integer. Right. We'll have D be a positive integer. Oops. Right then, there exists a unique Q and a unique R, right. such that R is between 0 and D, and it's such that a is equal to D times Q plus R. Right here, Q is called the quotient. And R is called the remainder. Right, and D is called the divisor. And we introduce the, the modulus operator here. And R is equal to A mod D. Right, and Q is equal to A. And we'll use the term div D. And so Q is the largest integer. Right, such that Q times D is less than or equal to A, and R is the remainder, right? Such that this equality holds. And right, so this is the modulus operator, right? It gives us the remainder, right? When we divide uh, an integer by some divisor, right? We get a quotient and then a remainder, right? The modulus, right, is the remainder. Right, we can do a quick example of this. Right, note that the remainder is between 0 and D. Right, strictly less than or equal to D. And, and note that the remainder is going to be positive in most definitions. This is not always true in application. In some programming languages, if you use the modulus operator, you might get a negative number back. So it's good to check that. All right, so let's do an example. Oops. Let's divide 83 right, by 9. You guys didn't think we'd be doing a division in this class, right? Let's divide 83 by 9. All right, so what do we get here? We're going to get a quotient and a remainder. With the remainder here is going to be 83 mod 9, which is equal to 2. 
right, the quotient V3, oops, div 9 is equal to 9. And it's, you can confirm this 83 is equal to right, 9 times 9 right, plus R, our remainder, 2. Right. We can do another example that sort of, again, reinforces our, our definition here, right, especially pointing out that the remainder is positive. Right, example, let's divide negative 11 by 3. All right, so we get our quotient minus 11 div 3 is equal to right, minus 4. Why is it minus 4? Because our remainder, the constraint of our remainder, right, minus 11 mod 3 right, is equal to 1. And you can confirm this, it's minus 11 right, is equal to minus 4 times 3 plus 1. Right, and some of the basics of the divides function. Right, we're going to learn some of the, the basic elements of uh, number theory, integers, and this will lead into some more interesting uh, concepts related to prime numbers, prime factorizations, graded common divisors, and then various encryption decryption schemes. First, we'll get through some of the basics. Any questions so far? Right, you can divide numbers. Let's do. All right, introduce some relationships and properties of the modulus operator now. Okay. Once right, so again, we'll let A and B be integers. And our modulo M is going to be positive. And then we say that A is congruent to B modulo M if M divides A minus B. And so we'll say A is congruent. This is our introduction to the congruence relation and to B modulo M. Put a comma there, modulo m. If m divides a minus b, right, and we write this out, you say a right here. We have three horizontal bars. This is the congruence relation again. Sometimes in, in math, we use these horizontal bars for other things, right? It's congruent to b, right, and then we say modulo m. That is. The relationship is shared between A and B modulo M. Right, the reason this is true, right, and also synonymous with this statement, right, is the following. You can call this theorem three. Right, again, we'll have A, B positive integers, M, B, uh, positive integer a and b just be integers. Right then, you can say a is congruent to b modulo m. All right, this is true if and only if, right, I'm just simply if and only if, right, a mod b, I'm sorry, a mod m, that is equal to b mod m. That is if we divide a and b by m, we get the same remainder. This statement is synonymous with saying that M divides A minus B. I encourage you to convince yourself of that. You can prove it to yourself. Sounds like a fun thing to do in your spare time, right? 
number theory proofs. Thanks. All right, so we can do an example of this. Check it out. Right, so again, our definition here, A is congruent to B modulo M. If M divides A minus B, this statement is synonymous with this statement here, that A mod M is equal to B mod M. And all three of these statements are the same. Okay. And so let's ask the question, is 17 congruent to 12 modulo 5? What that is? It is 17 congruent to 12 mod 5. We're going to ask our question. That's, well, the definition of mod, right, does 5 divide 17 minus 12? 17 minus 12 is equal to 5, right? 5 divides 5, and say yes. All right, we can also confirm this by checking to see if 17 mod 5 equals 12 mod 5, right? And they do, right, you get a remainder of 2 for both. And so again, since these definition, these statements are the same, right, you can confirm that this is true, right, using our initial definition here, right, or our follow-up definition of the modulus operator, and congruence and the modulus operator. All right, one more property of the modulus function, along with a proof. It'll be good to brush up on our proofs, right? You guys are getting rusty. You haven't done a proof in a while. You guys want to see another proof. We'll do another proof. All right, what theorem are we on here? Theorem, let's say four. All right, we'll let M be our modulo. It's going to be a positive integer. All right, we're going to let A, B, and C, and D be integers. And then we'll say if A is congruent to B modulo M, and C is congruent to D modulo M, Then, right, there's two premises that we can draw from, or two conclusions we can draw from this premise. Right, the first one right, is simply that A plus C is congruent to B plus D modulo M. Right, and A times C is congruent to B times D modulo M. All right, so let's work out uh, let's work out the proof for one of these. So here we have an implication, and right? we have if this is true and this is true, or if right, this compound predicate, then right, this conclusion, and we also have if this compound predicate, this conclusion here, and two conclusions. Let's prove the uh, first one. Right, so anything in the form of p implies q. Right, we need only show that q is true when p is true. Right, right? when p is false, this statement is trivially true. All right, so we need to show that when A is congruent to modulo, if when A is congruent to B modulo M and C is congruent to D modulo M, then A plus C is congruent to B plus D modulo M. All right, so we can assume, all right, in our proof, that A is congruent to B mod M. And C is congruent to D mod M. And we want to show that A plus C 
is congruent to the plus D mod M. And I'm gonna erase the, the top part and sort of keep what we've written there so far. So let's think to ourselves first, how can we get started with this proof? Well, we have some facts, right? We have the basic facts of mathematics that are available, right? but we also have our assumptions available to us. We're almost surely gonna need these assumptions to prove right, that our conclusion is true here. All right, so with the proof, right, we wanna have a starting point and an ending point, and it's like a journey. Our ending point here is A plus C is congruent to B plus D mod M. And so what's the basic definition of our modulus function that we, right, with the congruence? And I think theorem number two, right, said that this is true if M divides A plus C minus B plus D. Right, and it's looking back at theorem number two, right? So if we can arrive at this right, endpoint, then we have shown our conclusion, and we'll have to start here with these assumptions. Right, similarly, we can convert these assumptions to, right, this assumption is simply saying that M divides A minus B, and this says that M divides right, C minus D, again, all by theorem two. Right, so here, we'll just do simply, we'll be able to do an direct proof Right. right, we have our assumptions, we see what we need to show, we sort of have our starting point here, our finishing point. Right, so how can we get started here? How might we get these, these terms here, right, these divide terms, and use this information and arrive at this point, right? So here we sort of have two starting points, one and two, right, these two facts we can use, and we want to arrive at fact three. Right. Where might we start here? And using these two facts. These sorts of proofs are very similar to uh, our proofs of numbers being in even or numbers being odd. And we can rely upon our definition of the divides operator. And so how might we get this into some sort of closed form fashion? something closed form that we might be able to manipulate and such that we start off with these two facts and end up with this fact here. What's another way of saying that M divides A minus B? What's a way of saying that two divides A minus B? I'm saying that A minus B is even. How would we say that mathematically speaking? Think back to when we were doing proofs saying, to assuming that some number is even. How would you assume that some number is even using a, using a mathematical equation? I don't know, everyone's, everyone's completely zombied out today. It's just, I don't know. Let's look back to our definition of the divides. So what's the first thing we wrote today? Right, the division of A and B. And right, so if A divides B, right, that means that there exists some integer C, right, such that B is equal to AC. Right, does that seem reasonable? Right, this is the assumption we made whenever we assumed numbers or integers were even as well. Right? We just, this means that there exists some integer such that two times some integer equals this even number, right, the definition of an even number. Right, same here with our, with our assumptions here. Right, if M divides A minus B, this means that A minus B equals K times M, or some K that's an integer. Right, does everyone agree with that? M divides A minus B, it right, means that M is a factor of A minus B. All right. Right, similarly with our fact number two, right, this is fact number one. Right, fact number two, 
we have m divided c minus d. So similarly, we can say that c minus d is equal to some to use j times m and for some j an integer. All right, so here's our starting point. And note here our ending point three. And how might we use these two equations to arrive and to add some statement that would imply our conclusion here? C. <coughs> Let's think about this for a moment. How could we use these two qualities, and number one and number two, to arrive at a statement that is Sure, yeah, we have two equations. The left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. So we could add these two equations, and the sum of the left-hand side should equal the sum of the right-hand sides. So let's try that. I'm going to make some room for it. All right, so if we add these two sides, let's do the left-hand side first. We'll get, what, A plus C, right, minus, minus B minus D is equal to Km plus Jm. All right, we want to show that m divides a plus c minus b plus d. And we're almost there. Just a little bit of manipulation here. Right, we keep our a plus c. Right, we move uh, the minus sign out of a plus d or b plus d, and pull out our common factor m. And right, then we're done. And so here, this is equal to a plus c minus b plus d, and this is equal to m times k plus j, right, where k plus j is an integer. Right. right, and this implies that m divides a plus c minus b plus d. And so using our definition, right, of the modulus function, right? We have implied this, shown our conclusion, right? That's m divides a plus c minus b plus d, right? And then we can restate our conclusion and I'll go ahead and restate the conclusion up here thus. Right, if A is congruent to B modulo M, right, and C is congruent to D modulo M, right, then A plus C is congruent to B plus D modulo M. I encourage you guys to uh, practice proofs of this type. Right? You're very likely to see the second part of that theorem on the exam that is showing that AC is going to be congruent to BD mod M. And again, I encourage you guys to practice that. All right, at this point, let's take a two, three minute break and when we come back, we'll talk about some applications. We'll talk about hash functions, a really important concept in computer science that relies on some of these concepts, especially the common, often I should say, the modulus operator. some older homeworks up here that you guys have not picked up in your previous homeworks we want you to come up.
ये समझते हैं All right, guys, so we'll talk about one of the popular applications of some of this number theory to computer science. Uh, one of them is called uh, hash function, or hashing. All right, first we'll discuss the motivation of a hash function, see how it works, why it works, and then some common hash functions that are used. All right, so first, again, we'll start with this motivation. So searching a list of size n, we can visualize this. Let's say we have some linear list right, of size n. And let's say that there's n elements here. All right, what's the worst case upper bound right, in terms of big O for searching a list of size n? And assuming that we just have any old list, we're searching the list for some particular item. Right. And right, we're going to have proportionally n computational steps. Right? We'll have to search the first item, and maybe the second item, third, and we'll just keep going, traversing the list. To traverse a list of size n, we're going to need proportionally n operation and n times some constant number of operations ish to upper bound it. Okay. Everyone on board with that? Right. All right, so this can be somewhat ineffective, right? Not ineffective, it's certainly effective. So it can be somewhat inefficient, of course, when the size of n becomes very large. Right? If you have a very large database, a very large list, whatever structure you're using, right, if n becomes ten thousand or a hundred thousand, right, or or more, right, that's a lot of operations just to simply retrieve and some, some record or some object or some file that you've stored in a list. Right? And, so, and so for this reason, with this motivation in mind, right, computer scientists have been looking to add ways to make this more efficient. One way is to use a hash function. And right? so the idea here is that a hash function, or the idea underlying hash functions, is that rather than sort of randomly putting objects into lists and just putting them in any haphazard way, haphazard manner, just putting them at the end of the list or, or some, some other means, right? Having a pre-designated area in the list for each item, right? Almost like a reserved or predetermined spot for each item, right? The idea here is that whenever you're faced with putting an item in the list, right, you can look at the item and say, okay, this item goes into index, you know, 25, okay, right? And then if you're asked to retrieve an item, you can look at the item and say, oh, this item should be at index 25. Let's just go there and grab it, right? The savings and computational complexity is, should be fairly clear. Right, so it's very efficient. Of course, the crux of this is coming up with this magical means to determine this predetermined spot. What is this? What is this concept? And this is the concept of a hash function. So the idea of a hash function here is that we have some set of objects. We'll loosely define this first and then and then try to formalize it a bit. Right? And then these indices are these sort of these reserved spots of those. And we want to find a function that maps objects 
and we'll call this hash function h, two indices. Okay. Hash functions are usually defined on integers, however, so more appropriately, we generally will have some sort of integer representation for a key, a unique numeric integer identifier of each of the objects. And so hashes in actuality generally map from a key, right, an integer representation of the objects, to indices, indices, excuse me. Right. They certainly don't have to be. Right, the key here is very similar to the keys, keys that we defined, the primary key that we defined uh, earlier on in this class, and that it would be a, a unique way to identify you know, some elements in a set. And here are some objects that we want to put in a list. Right? So we have some unique identifier of these objects. Right? We'll call these unique identifiers keys. Right. So let's continue this, this motivation and discussion with an example. So let's say that you guys work for Georgetown University and it's your job to store student records into a list of some sort. How many, how many students do we have in Georgetown? About you know, like 10,000, 15,000, 12,000? Does anyone know off the top? 10,000-ish? Is that reasonable? Is it 17 now? We'll do 17. That's good. All right. So let's say that we want to, so our goal here, that you want to store all the student records into this list of size. So let's make it 20,000 just in case. You would say 20,000, a list of size 20,000, right? Such that we can retrieve this information efficiently, right? Such that when you're asked to retrieve a record of a student, you're not just going to sequentially go through the list and you're going to just be able to retrieve that information fast. And so let's store student records. in a list of size M. All right, again, visually speaking here, we have some list. All right, if we're asked to store Bob's record, for example, right, we're gonna put Bob into this list somewhere. Right. Right, the size of this list M is going to be equal to, what did we say, you're going to do 20,000, 20 K? Right. We'll make M equal to 20,000 in this particular example. Again, if we just randomly inserted Bob's record into this list and we wanted to search for Bob, right, it could be worst case on order of M operations to traverse the list to find Bob's record, retrieve it. You know, Bob wants to know how many more credits he needs to graduate. He doesn't want to wait, you know, a week for his record to come. He wants to be able to pull up that information quickly. All right, so how can, we, how can we determine this? The idea here is to come up with a hash function that will map right, some key of our students right, to indices of our students. So let's determine a common hash function first. Right, common hash function at h of k, that is given a key k, an integer representation of the items we're trying to store. And it's simply equal to, very simple one, but quite effective k mod m. And so why is this modulus operator a reasonable hash function here? And again, the idea here is that we're mapping from some key space to indices. Right? This is for a list of size M. Why is the modulus operator such a nice intuitive figure? Right, the hint right here is that we have modulo M. Why did we choose modulo M here? And what's the remainder? What are the, the range of possible values? What is the codomain? of k mod m. And what is this function always going to map to? What is the codomain of values? Uh, even more strictly? Uh, zero, zero. Zero, zero, two. zero, two. 
Right, zero two, right, m minus one. Right, we're dividing by m, right, so we're, we get the remainder out of this. So we're going to map to, right, our codomain, our indice space here, right, is all of the integers, right, between zero and m minus one. That's a one. Thanks. Right, just to make it clear that this is an integer. Right. So this is a very natural indexing function. This is mapping all of our keys right, to values 0 to m minus 1. Right. These are the indices right, for a list of size m, starting at 0, going to m minus 1. Right. So this is the intuition as to why modulo m is a great indexing function in general for indexing into a list of size m. Right. So the next problem with this is to find a key. Right, we want to find uh, an integer representation that uniquely identifies right, students at Georgetown. So what's a good integer representation? Right, what's, a good, what's a good key for Georgetown students? Yeah, sure. Hey, your net ID. I believe that's integer, right? Not, or student ID. Student ID? Maybe student ID is better. Yeah, so student ID. That will be a key. So we use student ID. All right, again here we're choosing a, a key that's an integer because our modulus function is defined on integer, so we want to feed in an integer value. And so we use student ID as the key. All right now we can better define our modulus function, or our hash function h. Our hash function is going to map from right, the set of all student IDs right, to the range 0 to m minus 1, right, integers in the range of 0 to m minus 1. And I'll use our more standard notation here. Right, specifically, we can define h right, of student id to be equal to id mod m. Right, and again, this is for a list of size m. All right, so we have a good key, right? A good one-to-one -one mapping from students to integers. And we have a, a good map into our indexing range. And so how might this work? We said that we'll use M as size 20,000. All right, we can do a quick example. Let's say that, let's say that Bob's student ID is, let's make it easy on us. Let's say it's 22,000. All right, so Bob's student ID is 22,000. All right, so if we want to put Bob into some list, all right, step one, all right, let's insert Bob. This is just sort of an insertion. Step one, compute the hash, right? Where are we going to put this object? It's a step one, compute hash. H, key. All right, in this case, this equals 22,000 mod 20,000. Right. All right, so according to this, at one index, is Bob going to go? Where's Bob's record going to go? All right, 22,000 mod 20,000. Right, you can divide it at once. We'll get a quotient of one with a remainder of 2,000. Seem, seem right? Am I able to add today? All right. All right, so here at index 2,000, let's say this is index 2,000 here. All right, we're going to go ahead and put Bob. Bob's record. 
right, so step one, note to insert, there's two main steps. Number one, compute the hash of the key. Number two, perform the assignment, right, or just simply insert. Right, that's the very brief version of the pseudocode to add an item to a list using our hash function. And looking at those steps, about how many, at least proportionally speaking, about how many computational steps does it take to add an object to a list using a hash? And about how many computational steps? Well, let's look at there's two main steps. How many computational steps are there on the first? Right. In order to determine the remainder, we need to perform a division. Right? So if you have two ints, performing a division is going to be a constant number of steps. It's just one division operation, right? at least the way we've been counting steps. Right. It's just division, determine the remainder. So it's some constant number of steps. Depending on your computer, the actual number of clock cycles might be like 12 or 15. Right? The number of actual steps, you could say maybe two or three. Right, but it's constant, right? So it's going to be right, for insertion right, using a hash. Right, the upper bound time complexity is simply big O of one. And that is, you can upper bound it with a constant number of steps. And right, no matter the size of our list, right? the insertion is going to be constant. We're ignoring a, a, com a complex case here, but we'll revisit it shortly. Right, any questions about why this is a constant number of steps here? Yes. So this is the complex, uh, me, the complex situation that we will revisit here. Uh, let's go through the step count first, and then we'll we'll revisit that problem. And again, so any any uh, any questions as to why we have a con uh, a constant upper bound here? Again, we just have two steps. Each one can be performed in a constant number of steps. Right? The size of our list is not relevant. Right. Let's look at a retrieval. And so we're inserting an item into the list using our hash, right, as a time complexity of one, which is very efficient. And what about a retrieval or search? All right, let's say we wanted to search our list for Bob, and Bob's record again. about how many, you know, proportionally speaking, about how many steps is this going to take in the worst case to search this list right, for Bob's predetermined location. What's that? I still can't hear. I'm still not getting it. It's still really loud. You said 20,000. M, you're saying big O of M. You're saying so we'd have to search the list, right, M times until we found it, right? That would be a standard sequential search. However, you're forgetting the fact that we have a hash function, a magical function that will map an object to its location in the list. Yeah. Right, yeah, so the pseudocode for, for insertion and retrieval is, is very similar, except number two is rather than insert, simply retrieve. So the magic, and this is the magic of our hash function here, is that it, it tells us where to store the item and it tells us where to retrieve it. Right? So to find Bob's record, we need only compute the hash of Bob. Right? Again, just one step. Right? And then just go to that index in the array and retrieve it immediately. Right? There's no need to search. There's no need to go to any other index. Right? We just go to where Bob is pre, to Bob's predefined location. Again, we have a constant number of operations. Right, upper bounded in the worst case by big O of one. And so, yes, and this is indeed the magic. And as as we just pointed out here, a huge savings in time complexity as we can reduce 
the number of computational steps from big O of M, the size of your list, to big O of one, and huge savings in time. I think you guys have a homework question very similar to this to write out the pseudocode for how to insert and retrieve items from uh, a list using a hash. And so I think this will help out with that particular uh, question. Any questions about the time complexity and why and we can do this right in a constant amount of time? Again, this is the this is the point. This is the motivation for hash functions. And our hash function is this magical function that will determine the location, the living place for any object that we might put in our list. It helps us to place items in the list essentially instantly with some constant number of operations and also retrieve and find items you know, instantly in this list. And a very common one is using the modulus function. We noted the characteristics of the modulus function, why this is a great hash function or an indexing function because it maps to the range 0 to m minus 1, the perfect indexing range for an array or a list. All right, so what problems do we have with, with this particular scheme? Well, one problem here is one that we call collisions. And what happens if H of Bob, right, or Bob's key, right, is equal to H of Sally? Right, this could occur, of course, if we have our, our big list. And so let's say that first we insert Bob into the list, so Bob is here. Right, but then we go to put Sally in the list, and then Sally is supposed to go into this same spot Bob is. So let's say that you know, Bob's key was what did we say Bob's key was? 22,000? And so his student ID was 22,000. All right, and that equals 2,000. Right. Let's say that Sally right, had an ID that that was 42,000. So if we go to try to insert Sally into list H of 42,000, is equal to 42,000 on 20,000, which is equal to 2,000 as well. Right. So when this happens, we call it a collision. That is, we try to insert Sally into a place in the list, however this list is occupied. And so this is a, a practical issue right, with a hash function. And in most, in a perfect world, we have what we call perfect hash functions, which will map each object to a unique index. And so it will be a one-to-one -one mapping from objects to indices and a one-to-one -one correspondence, so we won't have a collision. However, in practice, it is hard to find perfect hash functions. And in many instances, we therefore simply have to deal with collisions in some sort of reasonable way. Thanks. So let's say that you're tasked with building some hash class, right? or designing some hash class. How would you deal with a collision? And just heuristically, what might you do? Again, if you had a situation here where you have a collision, right? And you still want to use this hash function, and you still want to, you still want the time saving. You just have to deal with, you know, this collision case, which hopefully doesn't happen very often. Yeah. So probably one of the best ways to deal with collisions is to have a list of lists, if you will. Right. That is, I'll draw the array vertically here, maybe easier to. Right? So here. Right, let's say that we had Bob here in index 2000, let's say, 
And let's say we wanted to then insert Sally into this list. Right? One way to deal with this is to, rather than just having an array of records, we could have an array of linked lists of records. And therefore, if we get down to the correct index, we simply just add a node to the list. And so we'll have an array. Right? Bob is here. Right? Rather than worrying about this collision, we simply just add a new node to a linked list and put Sally here. Right? If we want to add anything else to that particular bucket, right, you can just keep adding to the linked list, letting it grow, and dealing with collisions on the plot by just simply adding nodes to a linked list. Right? A very good resolution to this problem. And there are some other heuristic ways to deal with these sorts of issues. And some, some of them simply will, and there's a sort of a localized search where you simply heuristic would just simply look plus or minus a few spots, see if there's any open spots. If there are, go ahead and click the item there. Right. None of these are, are perfect. Right. Again, the using linked list is probably one of the better ways to go. Right. In some instances, right, there will be an annex to your array, right. um, sort of a few, a handful or, or however many slots at the end of your array that you're not going to use with your hashing function, but rather just use for overflow. And where if you have a collision, you can just simply put an item in the overflow location. And then if you're ever searching for an item, you look for the item, something else is there, you simply just look in the overflow right, for the item. Right, all of these have various pros and cons associated with them. Right, um, again, in a perfect world, we would have a perfect hash function. Right, um, but in many, in the general case, right, this cannot be guaranteed. So we have to deal with collision somehow. Nonetheless, the saving is, is still quite, um, even if you have to deal with collision resolution with lists or annexes, the computational savings for retrieval is still quite, uh, quite evident. And as we're going from big O of M to big O of one. Any questions about caches, collisions? Yeah. All right, so determining the size of your list is going to affect the probability, very likely, of collisions. But if you have a, if you make your list too small, you're going to have, you, you might always have collisions. Right? If you make it too large, it might not be efficient, and you could still even possibly have collisions. Right? So the, the choice of M is an important choice. And you want to make M very likely so that it's large enough so you have enough space to put all the objects you want to put in your list. Right? Uh, and so in the time complexity right, for space, or the space complexity is directly related to M. It's going to be the go with M. Good observation. Any other comments, observations, questions? All right. And when we have a little bit of time, we'll go ahead and continue on with some of our number theory here. And we will introduce the concept of a prime number and then the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Now, so recently, they just found, okay, there was a little article in Nature or Science, and they just found a new prime number, Mersenne prime number. It's extraordinarily large. Yeah, they just, they just did. Yeah. I think it's the 49th one of the Mersennes, at least. And, uh, and so we'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring it on Wednesday. You can see it's a very large number. It's not really, it's not. You know, it's not even a real number. You know, these numbers they get so big, it's not even really comfort. You can't comprehend the size of these numbers, All right? But apparently, it has been determined to be prime, right? So, uh, so that was pretty cool. We'll look at some uh, prime numbers, characteristics of prime numbers, properties of prime numbers, right? And you know, the basis of number theory, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. We'll introduce. All right. So first, primes. All right, so the positive right, integer p is prime right, if the only positive factors.
and R1 and P. It's an integer that is not prime. It should probably say a positive integer that is not prime. And it is called composite. Right. right, so the definition of prime and composite numbers. And I think for your homework, you're asked to I defined prime and composite numbers. And you can convince yourself however you like that they are prime and or composite. And from this, we have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which builds upon this right up here, the fundamental. Right. And the fund fundamental theorem of arithmetic states right, that every positive integer and greater than one and can be written. Uniquely and as a prime or as the product of two or more primes. Right. And again, for your homework, you're asked to identify five prime numbers, I believe in five composite numbers. And for the composite numbers, list out their prime product expansion. That is, what, what are the primes that are the factors for that particular composite number? I will right, we'll do a few examples here. And that's probably a good, uh, a good stopping point here. All right, so here we have an example. Right, what is the prime number expansion for 512, and 512 right, is equal to 2 times 2 times 2, right, 9 times, which is 2 to the 9. And 2 is a prime number. It is the product of 2 9 times. Right. It is the only number that has you know, the prime products of 2 times 2 times 2 9 times. Right. This prime, these prime products uniquely identify 512. And the same with 14. 14 is equal to the product of 7 and 2. And no other number has the product of 7 and 2 except for 14. It's the prime factorization. And it's unique, it is unique for the number 14. And 15, and it's the product of 5 and 3. And 17 is the product of 17. Right. Right, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic says every positive integer greater than 1 can be written uniquely as a prime or product of primes. 17 is prime. All right, guys, that's a good stopping point for now. Uh, then we'll dive into the proof of how many number of primes there are. There are an infinite number of primes and we will prove it on Wednesday. Oh, how's it going?